Good morning and uh, greetings to all of you. We extend a warm welcome to the Ganga Anesthesia Refresher Course and to the Nerve Block Workstations. Today to start with, we will have an introduction, top uh, discussion and a lecture given by first Dr. Surjit Giri from Assam on uh, peripheral nerve stimulation blocks and second by Dr. Michael Barrington from Australia on ultrasound guided nerve blocks. To start, we will be dividing each of you into a group of 10 and we have 10 workstations and uh, all of you will rotate from one station to another. And all the 10 workstations are located within this auditorium. So there is no need for any of you to leave the auditorium for any, uh, for any, to move into any station. And uh, Dr. Balavenkat will be here to tell you exactly how you will rotate and what has to be done. Now I request Dr. Surjit Giri to start his lecture. Good morning to all of you. And I have been assigned uh, to describe about the basics of PNS. And first of all, I want to declare that uh, I have no conflict of interest because I am going to describe a machine and I have no in, uh, sponsors or not pro propagating any company. This is the, my first declaration. Now, what is the electrical nerve stimulation? Electrical nerve stimulation is nothing but method for localizing nerves by using external current. This is the basics. We apply the current from outside, we stimulate the nerve, locate the nerve, and deposit the local anesthetic. There are four phases of locating an, uh, nerves by PNS machine. Number one is the search phase. You, uh, you take as, you, you'd set the nerve stimulator at a stimulated setting, then we insert the needle through the skin, subcu fat, and ultimately you stimulate the nerve. And for that, you have to search the proper nerve. That is the search phase. Followed by an approach phase. When you're getting a contraction, suppose uh, median nerve stimulation, there's finger flexion, then you decrease the current to at lowest amplitude level, that is 0.4 or 0.3, then uh, that is called approach phase. Then next is the injection phase. Whenever you got the nerve at lowest amplitude, it does indicate the needle is close to the nerve. Then you deposit the local anesthetic. That is called the uh, injection phase. Next phase, that is the anesthesia phase. If you deposit the local anesthetics, it will reversibly block the nerves to the painfully stimuli. That is called the anesthesia phase. And after this phase, uh, anesthesia phase, you assess your block, whether it is working or not. If it is working, then you go for surgical stimulus. That completes the, in a nutshell, the peripheral nerve stimulation technique. Now, what are the electrophysiological uh, factors affecting the nerve stimulation? First and foremost is the uh, current strength and pulse duration. This is the first and foremost thing about peripheral nerve stimulator. So what is that? Uh, before going that, you have to know two terms that is called Riobes and Chronaxi. And the real base is nothing but the minimum current intensity which is required to stimulate a nerve, irrespective of duration of current. It, it, uh, the duration of current does not come here. That is called the real base. But chronic C is the uh, duration of the current. You are going to stimulate the nerve at twice the real base. And when the current stimulus is twice the uh, real base at given duration of the time, that is called chronaxi. Now, chronaxi is a term which is uh, 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 used to describe the excitability of the nerves or the muscle fibers. Now, what level? The, if the uh, nerve have a uh, myelination, means myelination, uh, the myelination of the nerve is inversely proportional to the chronaxi. If the myelination of the nerve increases, the chronaxi decreases. And if the, the nerve has a lowest chronaxi, that nerve is easily stimulated. That should, point should be remembered by all of you. If you see, uh, this is the high speed fibers, there is a motor fibers. They have low chronaxi, that is around 0.01 to 0.02 millisecond. But if you look at this uh, low intensity fiber, that is the sensory fibers, 
they have chronexia, chronexia around one milliseconds. What does it mean indicate? Means motor fibers has low chronexy and sensory fibers has highest chronexy. If the nerve have a low chronexy, that nerve is easily stimulated at lowest intensity of the current. You see, at this uh, current, uh, duration of the current, these are stimulated very easily than that of the sensory fiber. What does it indicate? It does indicate that you are, you, you are able to stimulate the nerve without stimulating the uh, sensory fibers. Means patient will not get pain, but there will be uh, nerve stimulation and ultimately there will be muscle contractions. This is the basis of uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. Next basis thing is the Coulomb's law. That is the distance of, uh, from the current stimulus to the nerve. Now, what is the Coulomb's law? It states that the intensity of the current is equi equivalent to, this is the case, the constant, and this is the minimum uh, intensity of the current at the needle tip, and divided by uh, square of the distance between the needle and the nerve. Now, if you re rearrange this equation, it comes around the intensity of the, intensity of the current is directly proportional to the uh, square root of distance between the nerve and the uh, needle. Now, what does it indicate? It does indicate that if the distance increases, the, uh, the current stimulus at the needle tip increases. If the distance decreases between the needle and the nerve, the current intensity uh, at the at, uh, minimum current at the uh, needle tip is decreases. Means you see, this is the nerve and this is the needle tip. Whenever it is far beyond from the nerve, it requires more current to stimulate the nerve. But if it comes closer to the nerve, it requires lesser current to stimulate the nerve. This is the basis of uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. Now, what, next point is the electrical polarity. The nerve, uh, the needle, the needle polarity should be always a cathode end. Why? What is the reason? If you see, this is the nerve fiber. This is the outside is positive end and inside is negative end. To uh, create an action potential, you people all know that it, 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 it have, there, there should be a decrease in electrical potential uh, outside and inside the nerve membrane. So if you use the cathode end, if the needle end is the cathode or negative end, what will, it will replace this positive ion and ultimately there will be a, a voltage difference and there will be a, a generation of action potential. Means if the, uh, this needle end is cathode end, there is easy to stimulate the nerve. But if it is a positive end, what will happen? This positivity are, uh, increases here, that is in the outside of the uh, membrane and they will create a hyperpolarization zone and it is very difficult to stimulate the nerve uh, if the needle end is a positive one. That's why the needle end should be always a negative end. Now if you uh, uh, look at a nerve stimulator, they should have some properties for an ideal nerve stimulator. Number one is that they should be a constant current generator. They should uh, ability to get uh, if you are setting, suppose, uh, 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 milliamps of around one, one milliamps of the current, the nerve should be stimulated at one milliamps of current only. Means if you set the five, the nerve should be stimulated at five milliamps of the current. Okay? Now, this uh, current that is uh, uh, displaying by the nerve stimulator and uh, delivering by the nerve stimulator to the uh, um, uh, nerve, it is influenced not only by the nerve stimulator, not only by the skin of the patient, not only by the uh, tissue characteristic of the patient, by the nerve block needle and its thieves, but it also depends upon the electrode, that is uh, uh, ground electrode, the cables connecting all elements. This all contributes to the variable impedance. So the constant current generator compensates this wide variability of impedance. So if the, if the nerve stability is variable current, uh, 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 current generator, then if you suppose uh, uh, stimulating the nerve at 1 milliamps of current, you may not be stimulating the current at 1 milliamps. The uh, needle, uh, nerve may be getting around 0.5 milliamps of uh, current. So that uh, that's increases the uh, nerve injury. So that's why the machine should be current, uh, the constant current generator. Now there should be current meters. Uh, you should be ability to decrease the uh, increase or decrease the current up to five milliamps of uh, intensities. That there should be digital display of flowing current, and the current you should have control over the current output, uh, current output, and the current that you are using. It should be a monophasic and rectangular. Right? Monophasic and rectangular means their current is going to the uh, unidirectional only. 
there should not be uh, means uh, from machine to the patient the current is going not from the uh, patient to the uh, uh, machine now pulse with it the duration of the current you should have liberal or ability to uh, increase or decrease the current from 0.1 millisecond 0.3 millisecond or 1 uh, millisecond duration or uh, in the newer nerve stimulator they are coming with a sense technique that is sequential uh, stimulation of nerve now there should be some safety features like connection disconnection alarm there should be low battery status alarm there should be impedance alarm in the nerve stimulator that's that may be uh, uh, pulsating as a beep sound or there should be there may be uh, appearing as a flashing light now you should have ability to choose the frequency from 1 hertz to 2 hertz and if you look at the stimulating needle this needle is whole of the needle shaft is coated okay they are insulated except the tip where the, the electrical pulses are discharged and they are clearly marked there are 5 cm needle 2.5 cm needle 10 cm and 15 cm needle like marking like uh, 1 cm 2 cm 3 cm 4 cm 5 cm 5 cm needle and it should have a clear extension tube that through wh where you are injecting the local anesthetics it should be clear and it should be transparent so that uh, you can early detect the blood if the needle is over the blood vessel and this this cable that should be insulated one otherwise what will happen it, it will dissipate the current and it will give some false value to you now why the stimulating needle should be insulated uh, the shaft should be insulated you see th this needle is not insulated the shaft is not insulated now what will happen if you uh, 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 stimulate, uh, you try to stimulate the nerve, the currents are dissipated from all over the shaft as well as from the tip and it requires a higher amount of energy to stimulate the nerve. But if the need, uh, needle is insulated throughout the shaft and tip is uh, discharging the only the electrical pulses, it requires very lesser amount of the current to stimulate the nerve. Uh, you can use uh, 30 degree blunt needle and 15 degree blunt needle but nowadays uh, most of the needles are coming at a 30 degree blunt needle and that will decrease uh, the nerve injury if you are uh, suppose uh, about the nerve. And next uh, hot question is uh, in peripheral nerve stimulator suppose uh, you are stimulating the nerve then you give the local anesthetics one level of local anesthetics uh, the contraction disappears. Same thing applies if you use the normal saline, the contraction disappears. But if you use dextrose, 5% dextrose, then what will happen? The contraction is still there. What is the reason? Actually, the reason is that the previously is taught if you inject the local anesthetics, the, the, the distance between the needle and the local anesthetic increases, and so it will require larger amount of current again to stimulate the nerve. But this is not true. This is, uh, there is a lot of uh, study on this topic and it was found that uh, this, this depends upon the conductivity of the solution. This normal saline, this is a conductive solution and local anesthetic is again a conductive solution. But that 5% dextrose is not a conductive solution. Now what will happen, if you are using normal saline, then what will, the, the, the electrical stimulus, this current uh, will displace through this normal saline and it will uh, uh, dissociates the normal saline into sodium and uh, chloride ion that is positive and negative ion. Now they will form an ionic curtain between this uh, nerve stimulus in, uh, current as well as the nerve. So this curtain will prevent the dissipation of the current from needle tip to the nerve and you are not able to stimulate the current, uh, um, uh, nerve, uh, sorry, uh, nerve. But which is not true in dextrose solution, solution because dextrose solution is not a conductive fluid. That is the reason. Now this uh, video I have uh, prepared for uh, guard only uh, for uh, peripheral nerve stimulation description. So, so you can, so you can display, yes. So this should display the zero zero. This is the amplitude. This is the duration. This is the hertz. This is the impedance, and this is the battery status. It should display whenever you switch on the nerve stimulator. Okay. Now. <coughs> The nerve stimulator should have distinct positive and negative end, distinct, and it should be color coded. This is the positive end to the patient, P for P, that is positive end to the patient, and it is red. And this is the negative end, which is attached to the needle. It is a black, always a color coded, means it is a black, means 
there is a, a negative n and it is to the needle n for n and whenever you set the needle, this, uh, sorry, nerve stimulator, this is the set uh, uh, patient current and the upper one is the set current. And this places, sorry, 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 excuse me. This is the set current. This is the desperate current. So whenever you touch the Once needle to the patient, there is a definite changes in the beep sound. As well as this color becomes green. And this flashes will go to the green color. Okay. So, so I am touching my hand. See, see? this median stimulation. This beep changes and uh, color also changes. This machine should be uh, the current should be rectangular and it should be monophasic. Okay, this is at 0.1 millisecond and it is mostly applied for the missed nerves. But suppose the patient has polyneuropathy, you need more current duration, then you have to increase the duration to 0 0.30 millisecond in polyneuropathy patient, diabetic patient and which have some neurological problems. But if you want transcutaneous stimulation, then you have to increase the duration to one, one millisecond. milliseconds of current. Okay, two hertz means you are giving or is stimulating the nerve with him two impulse per second. This is the two current at 0.1 millisecond, 0.1 milliseconds. Okay, this is one hertz that it will gives one impulse per second. And it is sense technique is that uh, the first two uh, current will be at 0 0.1 millisecond, 0 0.1 millisecond followed by 0 0.3 milliseconds. Okay. And what is of the two hertz technique is that you are not missing any nerves. But this advantage of this technique that it will cause us stimulus like the tuck, 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 two hertz of currents, two impulses per second will cause us discomfort to the patient with a lot of trauma, hand trauma or foot trauma, whatever it is there. To reduce this uh, uh, discomfort to the patient, you can switch to the one hertz current and the stimulus will be like this. Tap, 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 like this. Now, uh, disadvantage of this uh, one hertz technique is that you may miss the nerves. But here, suppose nerve is we are going to stimulate this nerve. This is a sense technique. And we are introducing the needle like this. So you may, you are now discharging, in the sense technique we are discharging one, two and three. Three current. Now three, because of this three current and because of the longer duration current, it will stimulate more early and easily. It, it is said, uh, it, it produces the three, three impulses, one from the longer duration current, and second one from the smaller, and third one from the smaller duration of the current, and it will cause it three rhythmic contractions if the, uh, if, if the needle is close proximity to the nerve. So, by looking the See. contraction also, you should know what, two hertz, what the heart patient is getting. Like this. These are two hearts, this is in two hearts stimulating. Second. This is the one heart. See? Okay. Now what will happen in the sense technique? There will be three contractions. See, see? Three impulses. See? So, uh, the facts about the PNS is that PNS is adjunct and it is not in substitute to RA anatomy. Means you have to know thoroughly about the regional anesthesia anatomy. It is not reliable if the patient is getting muscle relaxant. But remember, it can be used in central neurological patient, uh, uh, patient also. Now, this peripheral nerve stimulator can be used beyond the peripheral also. You can use in the 
uh, patient has uh, epidural catheter placement, and if you are, uh, you should get the contraction at one to ten milliamps uh, current. And if the misplaced to the subarachnoid or subdural catheter, you'll get a response at less than one milliamps of current. And if no motor motor response at ten milliamps, means the catheter is probably in the subcutaneous tissues. And nowadays we are looking uh, locating the uh, this one caudal space in uh, kids by using the peripheral nerve stimulator also. So peripheral nerve stimulator is not only peripheral, it can go to the central also. Thank you very much for your Good morning, everybody, and um, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful meeting and to visit your amazing country. This is my fourth visit to India, and it's really exciting to be here. So my name's Michael Barrington. I'm being asked to talk about the principles of ultrasound-guided regional anaesthesia. So that's obviously a vast topic. I've been given 30 minutes. I'll try and keep to less than 30 minutes so that we can get started with the hands-on workshops. I'll also just note that I am focusing on principles. I'm not focusing on specific nerve block techniques. So we're going to keep it fairly broad. We're not going to get bogged down into details too much. I have no financial disclosures to make. I do, however, acknowledge research support from the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthetists. So choice of machine. When we, when we start using ultrasound for our various procedures, such as regional anaesthesia, central venous access, echocardiography, we get caught up with what machine to get. And um, ultrasound technology is pretty much the same technology it's been for decades, except that there's been amazing proprietary improvements that often involve software improvements improvements to the algorithms, things that you can't actually see because it's all part of the computer technology. But really it's all pretty much the same. I've got some old machines there in that picture, but really the buttons on the old machines are very similar to the buttons and knobs on the new machines. So often when we choose a machine it obviously comes down to image quality, but the machines are very similar. Price, Range of probes I think is critical. When we go to buy a machine, we have to get the machine with the probes that match our specific application. We want to know that the company will provide upgradability when software upgrades occur. And we want, to, we want a long-lasting warranty because surprisingly these machines don't last that long. And even after three or four years in our department, our machines are really showing signs of wear and tear. And you want to know that your people who are selling you the machine are going to be there after the sale. So down to image optimization, there are two broad areas in which we can optimize images. We can change the settings on the machine, or we can change the transducer manipulation and, and, and um, move the transducer to get the ideal um, picture and image. And I mentioned before the machines all pretty much have the same buttons, and I've highlighted some of the important buttons, such as color Doppler, depth, and a few other buttons here on an older machine, but they're all pretty much the same. We've got the focal point, we've got the frequency, we've got the focal position. In some of the machines, you can't actually adjust the focal point. The focal point is set at a certain depth down the picture as part of an algorithm. And likewise, you can't numerically change the frequency. So the machines are a little bit different in that sense, but essentially, these are really important buttons to know where they are, the depth, the gain, the frequency, the focal point. The next important choice when you go to do a procedure is what transducer to use. And this is the single most important choice, I believe, that will influence the type of image 
uh, and success of the procedure because the transducers all have their um, various features and attributes. So in the picture here, we've got a curvy linear transducer. And one of the advantages of a curvy linear transducer is you get a wide field of view. So you can see a needle or coming out from the white from outside of the field. You can see a lot of structures away from the target of interest. Another advantage is it gives you penetration because a curvilinear transducer is a low frequency transducer and that means you get penetration which means you can uh, image the deeper structures. So this type of transducer is used for deeper targets, for example deeper than three or five centimetres. The downside with a curvilinear transducer with the low frequency is the decreased spatial resolution. So the quality of the image is not as crisp as with a transducer, such as a linear transducer, that typically operates at a higher bandwidth. So the higher bandwidth transducers are more suitable for superficial structures, such as the brachial plexus, um, perhaps some lower, lower limbed um, targets in thin individuals. So this type of transducer gives us a different field of view. The field of view is not quite as wide as a curvy linear transducer, but it's still relatively wide and it has, operates at a higher bandwidth, therefore uh, increased spatial resolution. There are other transducers such as a, 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 a transducer such as this, which still has a linear array, but it just has a smaller footprint. But take note that the size of the transducer is reduced. And that highlights another feature of ultrasound technology. They rely on the piezoelectric crystals, which are contained in the transducer. And a transducer like this has less piezoelectric crystals than a normal linear transducer. So we're always, when, we, when, we're, when we're starting off with ultrasound, we're learning new skills. And when we move to a new block that we haven't done before, we haven't done it many, on many occasions, we're learning new skills. So we have to learn sonography skills. We have to learn how to capture the image. We have to learn how to hold that image, maintain it steady while we're putting the needle into the plane of the ultrasound. And we need to be able to interpret the image. So the images don't come with labels, as you see with um, very prominent articles. We have to interpret the images and not misinterpret them. And we need, need good needling skills. And most importantly, we have to identify the nerve but I challenge you, we have to not just identify the nerve, but we have to identify the epineurium on the nerve. We need to know where the outer border of the nerve is at all times. It's not just knowing about the neural sonography, though. We need to know the knowledge of the surrounding anatomy, and often it's knowledge of surrounding anatomy that allows us to better put the picture together, better allows us to identify the nerves and the structures that we, don't, uh, that we want to uh, avoid um, impinging on. And it's, in many cases, it's about tracing the known course of the nerve or plexus, and that particularly applies to the brachial plexus and also the sciatic nerve. So wherever we can trace the course of the nerve, we should do so. So we'll just go back to image optimization in a little bit more detail. And we talked about these, how important these settings were before. And here's a really simple example where the depth has been set too great. So you can see the depth is set close to six centimetres for a very superficial structure. As soon as we reduce the depth, the target structures become more obvious. We can see the, the neural structures much more, much more clearly. And this is one of the most common mistakes that our trainees make when they go to first start scanning, is that they set the depth inappropriately too great or too little for a deeper target. So you always must go back to basics and check your depth. The other common, and here's another example where we're looking at the trunks of the brachial plexus, where in the, the larger picture it's more difficult to see, but as soon as we zoom in, the trunks are much clearer. Another basic setting that our trainees sometimes forget is the gain setting. An example of too much gain on the right means that all the signals are coded as white and you can't see, you can't see any of the structures that you want. And so gain is a little bit like it has, we have individual preferences, but we must pay attention to gain. And perhaps one of the most important things we can do in terms of um, that's related to gain is reducing the um, intensity of the ambient light. And when you see experienced cardiac um, echocardiographers start to, to image the heart, they always reduce the uh, ambient light. So you get less reflection and you, there's less tendency to turn the gain up. Of course, there's other things such as um, frequency. And this is very basic. Some of the machines have taken away a sophisticated setting for frequency. It's just set at general. Um, 
resolution or penetration. But some machines you can adjust the, um, the frequency and hear the frequencies um, set appropriately for the target. But, oh, sorry, here, sorry, here the frequency is set too low. But as soon as we increase the frequency, we increase the spatial resolution and the target is more clear. Another important technique, and I'm going to cover two things here, is, prep, is, is, um, is protecting the probe. As soon as we do an invasive procedure using ultrasound, the transducer becomes a vehicle for infection. So good infection control mandates that we do not get blood on the transducer, that we clean it appropriately after each use. In our hospital, we use a sterile sheath. But the other point of this picture is when we do put gel on the transducer and put a sheath or plastic over it, then we put it on the patient. We want to avoid a situa situation like this where you can see a big black shadow coming through the middle of the screen, and that means there's poor contact. So air is being managed to get between the transducer and the skin. So we always must look for that. So the question that's relevant to our discussion now is which factors which can affect ultrasound image quality include transducer frequency, subcutaneous emphysema, tissue edema, skin transducer interface. And of course, the correct answer is all of the above. So ultrasound imaging requires meticulous attention to technique, and a lot of it is going back to the basics, as we've discussed. So what about transducer manipulation? Our, we need to know what we can do to use the transducer to improve the quality of the image, and the most basic step is aligning the transducer along the known course of the nerve. And in this context, you do need to know know something about the surface anatomy and the normal anatomy of a structure. We can rotate the probe, which is relevant particularly when, we've got a, a, when we're trying to get the needle in plane. We can also tilt the probe. Tilting the probe is critical. And the other thing we can do is rock the probe in the long axis of the uh, transducer to, to improve needle imaging. And the last technique, which I haven't mentioned here, and it's particularly relevant to deeper structures, is pressure. We need to apply pressure on the transducer and often that reduces the distance between the target and the, the probe interface, improving the quality um, of the image. Here's an example of, of how when we change the angle of insonation through tilting the probe, we get a much crisper image. In the bottom, bottom picture, the probe, the ultrasound, was not at right angles to the target structure, and a lot of the ultrasound beams go off away from the transducer. They don't return to the transducer. But when we've got the transducer aligned at 90 degrees, roughly, to the target, more of the ultrasound comes back to the transducer, we get a crisper image. So this principle is known as anisotropy. Tracing the known course of a nerve is critical for the sciatic nerve and the brachial plexus, I believe. And I'll give you some examples here. And maybe you look at this in the example and say, well, I wish you could do better than this, Michael. This picture's not so good. You come all the way from Australia. But look at all that. That's actually the sciatic nerve. When you started looking at that picture, it probably wasn't that clear, but once you look at it in a dynamic fashion, it becomes clearer. I've deliberately given a, an average, average picture quality here just to demonstrate that with dynamic scanning of the nerve along its known course, you can identify the structures. Here's a nicer picture for you. We've got the head of the fibula here. We've got the common perineal nerve there superficially. We've got the tibial nerve here coming in from the right. Tibial nerve, perineal nerve coming together as we trace up the thigh. The two nerves are coming together, and this is what we know as the sciatic nerve, tibial nerve, perineal nerve. We've got the femur down the bottom, the linear asper of the femur. We've got the vastus lateralis here to the right. We've got posteriorly here, we've got the long head of biceps. Laterally to that and deep to that, we've got the short head of biceps. So you get the impression that we're not just looking at the nerve, we're looking at the surrounding structures. The surrounding structures are what make it feasible. As we go in the mid-thigh, the structure gets deeper. The sciatic nerve gets deeper. So maybe this is not a great place to do a nerve block because the nerve is deeper. As we come more superficial in towards the subgluteal region, the shape of the nerve changes. It becomes flatter. And it also becomes more superficial. Perhaps this is a better place to do a nerve block. So as we come up, we can see it clearer and clearer. So for a sciatic nerve in the thigh, in my opinion, the best two locations are either subgluteal here or in the popliteal fossa. So tracing the nerve along its known course is critical. Here's an example here, and again, I haven't given you amazing image quality, 
but we've got the axillary artery here, we've got the humerus. So we're scanning high in the humerus. And this structure here, I'll let you know now, it's the radial nerve. It's the radial nerve as it traces down to the posterior part of the humerus. And it's, it has an oblique core, so therefore it doesn't appear as a round structure. We've got another structure here that stayed right next to the artery, all the way down the humerus. We're scanning down the humerus. That structure there was the, that structure there was the median nerve. So these structures that we look for every day have patterns that we can identify only through dynamic scanning, not through static scanning, not through putting the probe on one particular place. There's other things that we need to keep a look out for. Admittedly, there aren't many places where we do regional anaesthesia where there are tendons, but there are some locations. One location is, I guess, if we're looking for the ulnar nerve towards the elbow, not that we would inject close to the elbow, but that structure there is very echogenic, and when you look at that, you think it could be a nerve, but in fact it's a tendon. How do we determine the difference between a tendon, which is echogenic, and the nerve, which is hypo, is, is not very echogenic? Well, we have to trace the um, known course of the nerve. So we start off here in the distal uh, humerus near the medial epicondyle, and we're looking for a structure up here. It's very here, it's very subtle, it's, it's um, hypoechoic, it's come from the posterior side of the medial epicondyle. It's only one structure that does that and goes into the superficial um, tissues here and stays in that location all the way up the humerus. That's the ulnar nerve. So although it's very hypo, uh, hypoechoic, difficult to see, if you trace it along its known course, you can be confident that what you're looking at is the nerve. How else we can distinguish a tendon from a nerve? When we trace along a tendon, the tendon disappears into the fleshy component of the muscle. And you can see that here the tendon is becoming smaller and smaller and it's going to disappear into the muscle. So that can't be a nerve, that's a tendon. It's important to know the differences between tendons and nerves in some locations, particularly in the forearm, where there's a lot of tendons that we can get mixed up with the nerves, because tendons also exhibit anisotropy in the same way that nerves do. There's artefacts, and this is another pitfall. We need to know about artefacts, and in this case, we've got some artefacts that we could get mixed up in, but really, if you look at, do a little bit of ultrascanning, you'll see often there's an artefact deep to a large artery. This is called a dorsal enhancement artefact. We must not get that mixed up with the nerves, which uh, in this case are to the left or lateral of the artery. Artifacts. So um, another artifact is the needle reverberation artifact. This is a good artifact because this means the needle is in plane with the beam, with the ultrasound beam. When you get a re reverberation artifact, you get um, uh, extra um, images of the needle deep to the image, and it's due to the ultrasound waves reflecting within the needle. So this is a good artifact because it tells you that you are in plane. There's also tissue reverberation as well, and this comprises linear echoes and also duplications of a large artery. So you can get a large artery duplicated and this is a form of a reverberation artefact. Another artefact is known as the bayonet artefact and you often see this when you're doing a popliteal sciatic nerve block. So we've got the popliteal, uh, sorry, the uh, sciatic nerve there in the popliteal fossa. We've got the needle coming across here and the reason why the needle appears to bend is because the needle is going through tissues, different, different tissue types that have dish, different velocities of ultrasound. So the ultrasound machines assume that all the tissues that we're image, imaging, imaging have the same, um, the ultrasound has the same velocity through those tissues. So a bayonet artifact, so don't get mixed up with that. There are other pitfalls when we put on the colour Doppler and we expect to get a strong colour Doppler signal. If the transducer is at right angles to the flow, then we get a weak signal because this, the Doppler signal re, re, de, depends on the cosine of 90 degrees, which is what, sorry, which depends on cosine of the angle, the incident um, angle of incination. So therefore, when we're scanning at 90 degrees, we're scanning at, um, the, the, the Doppler signal becomes uh, zero. So what we need to do in that setting is change the angle of incination, just tilting slightly, and then you get a stronger color uh, colour Doppler signal. So this is really important to be aware of. Other things that we also have to be aware of is compression of veins. We compress veins, we obliterate them, then we take the pressure off a vein and then it becomes um, a vehicle in which we can inject local anaesthetic, for example. 
And we need to know that nerves are mobile. We put the transducer onto a nerve, onto a plexus, and it can move from its original structure. Finally, another pitfall, and this is not massively critical, but it's easy to get a muscle mixed up with a blood vessel in some locations. In this location, we're scanning just above the clavicle, and we've got a long tubular hypoechoic structure. Some of my trainees look at that and think it's a blood vessel, but this is the omohyoid muscle. So it's just something to keep in mind. The bone. Bone does not transmit ultrasound. It reflects ultrasound. So therefore, when we're putting an ultrasound transducer near bone, we get a lot of dropout. And here's, here we're scanning the humerus. But anywhere where, where there's a lot of bone, it makes ultrasound imaging challenging because we get dropout. So therefore, we've got to use that dropout as, as, a, as part of the map to, to, to or orientate ourselves and see where we are. There's an excellent article published many years ago by Brian Seitz, and this is core material which I recommend to my trainees, artefacts and pitfall errors associated with ultrasound-guided regional anaesthesia, published in Regional Anaesthesia and Pain Medicine. And this is core knowledge required for all our practitioners when we're, when we're, um, when we're learning and when we're maintaining our, our skills. So we talked about surrounding anatomy before. You only see what you know. And that's a quote by a very famous uh, anatomist from Austria, Bernard Marigal. Because we really often struggle to see the structures because they're deep, because they're small, because they have weak ultrasound signals. So therefore we need to know all the anatomy that surrounds the structures. We've talked about it already in those dynamic scans, scanning up the thigh. But here's more examples. We're looking at the cytic nerve in the mid-thigh. And in this case, the cytic nerve is very bright. It's very easy to see. But often the cytic nerve is not easy to see, so we need to be better identify the surrounding non-neural structures to be confident what we're looking at. And I've identified some of them here again. Just as revision, we've got the biceps femoris, posterior, the vastus lateralis, a lateral adductor magnus anterior, and the linear aspera of the femur is an important non-neural landmark for cytic nerve block. In the, ulna, in the forearm, when we're looking for the ulnar nerve, the ulnar nerve is very small. It's very, very small, and we rely on its reliable relationship to the ulnar artery to locate its position, and so we don't get it mixed up with tendons. We talked about before not getting tendons mixed up with nerve, but the nerve is reliably immediately medial to the ulnar artery in the forearm, and so that's a very useful landmark. Likewise, the median nerve in the forearm is located between the deep and superficial flexors. And if we scan up and down the forearm, we can distinguish the median nerve from the flexors of the forearm. Perineural adipo peri adipose tissue sometimes gives us a clue. In this case, we've got a slight halo, hypoechoic region surrounding the cytic nerve. Often there is adipose tissue surrounding the cytic nerve in the popliteal fossa, and that gives us a clue that the, that the structure that in the middle is, is the nerve. And it almost looks like local anaesthetics already been injected here, but no, this is adipose tissue that you see in many locations close to the nerve. So we'll talk about the needle relationship to the probe here, and commonly we do our procedures either in plane or out, out of plane. And when we talk about in plane or out of plane, we're referring to the needle. We're referring to the relationship of the needle to the ultrasound beam. And in this case, in this example, this is an in plane approach where the target is in short axis. So that we have a short axis view of the target which is something we commonly do because it's easy to, see, easy to see nerves in short axis rather than long axis in most locations. And now the needle is in plane. And the advantage of that technique is that you know where the needle tip is, you can avoid causing trauma to the nerve, avoid using trauma to other structures. But it's challenging. Ideally, we'd see have an image like this. We, in the brachial plexus and the axilla, we can see the needle all the way along nice reverberation artifact. If it was like this all the time, we'd be very happy, but it's not. I imaging a needle is challenging in many locations. Sometimes we, we have a deep structure, such as the sciatic nerve, and it's useful to separate the needle from the probe to give yourself a better approach to the nerve. 
If you came too close to the probe in many locations, particularly for a deep structure, it makes it more difficult to see the needle. So needle imaging is one thing we need to put a lot of resources into when we're teaching our trainees because a lot of the ultrasound beam, when it hits the needle, it reflects off at 90 degrees and it goes away from the goes away from the needle, does not come back to the probe. So there are some techniques that we can use, and I've mentioned one of them already. Starting close to the transducer with the needle means that you may have a very steep structure, a, a, a steep trajectory. If the, if the target is superficial, well, it doesn't matter. But if the target is relatively deep, separating the needle from the probe, separating the needle from the transducer may help your trajectory and help with needle imaging. We can also rock the transducer. And on the left, we've got an example of where we're um, rocking the transducer in the wrong direction. And on the right, we're rocking the transducer in the, correct, in the correct direction to increase the amount of ultrasound echoes that return to the transducer from the needle. We can use a step-down approach. So we can deliberately start off superficial. Once we've got the needle in plane of the ultrasound, we can step down gradually and, and keep the needle in plane that way. We can also use hydrodissection, and hydrodissection is used commonly in many procedures, particularly deep procedures, um, procedures where the image quality can be challenging or the target deep, such as paravertebral block or lumbar plexus block. We can hydrodissect with saline even to get us a sense of where the needle tip is, because when we hydrodissect, we put contrast around the needle tip, and that makes it easier to see the needle tip. The other technique is out of plane. With the out of plane approach, the needle can be more difficult to see. The outer plane approach has advantages though. The outer plane approach has a shorter tissue path, so it may be less, it may be less uh, more comfortable for a patient. I'm not necessarily advocating in plane or outer plane. My approach for most procedures is in plane, but there are some settings where I'd really prefer to do a technique out of plane if I could. And then one example is the femoral nerve block. I prefer to go out of plane. When I'm going out of plane, it's difficult to see the needle, even the shaft, and particularly the needle tip. So I'm relying on indirect clues as to where the needle tip is. We can hydrodissect, but also we can use the fascial planes, because as we push down on the fascial planes, we get tenting, and it makes it, it's, it's quite, a, quite a good signal to see with um, the ultrasound. Here's an example of an outer plane approach to the, the uh, interscaling uh, region, and again, you can do this. Again, you have a much shorter needle trajectory. The outer plane approach can be used for a cytic block, particularly if you're putting a catheter in. I've just put this video in here just to highlight how with the outer plane approach, you don't see much of the needle. In this case, we're relying on tissue moving, movement. We're relying on shadowing. And then we're going to use the injectate to help us give us more clues as to where the local anaesthetic is. Really, we really need to be very careful with an outer plane approach that we don't advance the needle too far and cause needle trauma. We can rotate the needle at right ang at, at right. We can rotate the transducer at that point at right angles to get a long axis view of the nerve and get the needle in plane. So sometimes we can combine an outer plane approach with an in plane approach and get the best of the the attributes of both those techniques. So where should we aim? When we inject local anaesthetics, we need to make a decision where to aim in terms of effectiveness, where to aim in terms of safety, and it probably uh, depends a bit whether it's a plexus or a nerve. My advice, my only advice, is perineural spread. There's no justification for injecting into a nerve. So we always should aim for perineural spread, and I recommend aiming to the side of a nerve. Don't aim at the nerve. Use the fascial planes that surround a nerve to for your advantage to improve spread around a nerve. And really, um, this is just an example of doing an auxiliary brachial plexus block, very straightforward procedure. And when I talk about perineural spread, this is what I mean, injecting outside of the nerves, outside of the epineurium. And when we start injecting outside of the nerves, it makes it easier to see the nerves. It makes it very, we're very confident where we've injected the local anaesthetic obviously, and where the, the neural structures are. Here's, a, here's an example of something I do not recommend. Here we're injecting around the medial nerve, in the median nerve in the forearm. At least we thought we were injecting around the median nerve. Then as the practitioner continues to inject, you'll notice the structure down here is going to change in shape. See how it swells up? 
That's an example of an intraneural injection, which I do not recommend. Okay, so what can we do? We just need to have meticulous attention to technique. You don't always get amazing images. Just go slowly, do all the, go through all the preliminary steps to get the needle aligned with the ultrasound um, beam. Go through all the steps to make sure you're confident where the nerve structures are by tracing the known cause. And then you'll get pictures like this with very clear perineural spread. Another pitfall is ergonomics. Some of our trainees don't pay enough attention to positioning the patient and ergonomics. Positioning of the patient is critical for almost all of our procedures and ergonomics, setting up the ultrasound machine, its relationship to the patient, the trolley, the bed is very important and it's going to change from um, room to room. Common errors, advancing the needle when not being visualised and unintentional probe movement. This has been demonstrate, demonstrated in research and we really need to work hard to improve our skills in this area. Um, we won't go through that in, in more detail. As a checklist, um, when I'm teaching trainees, I want to see that they've done an appropriate preoperative assessment and consultation. I want to see that they've thought about the choice of technique, the drug, drug type and dosage, that they've gone through the usual patient identification procedures, that they're using a sterile technique, that they're demonstrating that they're familiar with the ultrasound technology or whatever technology they want to use. I want to make sure that they're monitoring for side effects such as local anaesthetic toxicity, sedation, block e efficacy. I want to see that they can anticipate and treat side effects. And I want to see that their care of the patient extends into the post-operative period, and this involves transition analgesia and care of the insensate limb. There's guidelines on training and education in this area in, from, published from the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. Other useful tasks are identifying key landmarks, identifying the nerve and plexus in short axis, confirm normal anatomy and variations, plan for an approach which avoids unnecessary trauma, and use an aseptic technique with respect to probe. And I reinforce what I said before, when we do an invasive procedure with an ultrasound transducer, the ultra trans, ultrasound transducer then becomes a vehicle for infection for the next patient. So it's a, we need to take good care of the transducer. This is my checklist which I give to the trainees to look, to think about how they're going to do, um, how they're going to approach regional anaesthesia. And finally, although I'm talking about ultrasound, I just go, uh, like to reinforce what the previous speaker said, nerve stimulation is a valid nerve localisation technology. It's a very useful technology. It can be used in conjunction with ultrasound to confirm some of the pictures. And I recommend that um, if you have an image that you're not clear about, that you also use nerve stimulation. I think I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Barrington. But also take this opportunity to thank you for traveling all the way from Australia to be with us. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Barrington, who has done a lot of work in regional anesthesia, very passionate in regional anesthesia, and one of the big names in regional anesthesia in Australia. He spearheads the spread of regional anesthesia in Australia. He, as you know that you would have seen his name in the Journal of Anesthesiology. He's part of the editorial board of that. It's great pleasure to have you, Dr. Michael, with us this day in the workshop and also as a part of our conference. Looking forward to having uh, interesting interactions with you. Also great pleasure in introducing you to the faculty who will share the day with you. Dr. Satish Gulkarni, Head Department of Anesthesia at Leelavati Hospital, Mumbai who has been a member of the Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India, Dr. Satish Gulkarni for you, who is going to share his thoughts with all of you. Great pressure in presenting Dr. Shailesh Mulgonka, one of the leading anesthesiologists in Mumbai, a person who does tremendous number of orthoplasty, very popular for his lower limb blocks in Mumbai. Can I have Dr. Shailesh Mulgonka for you? Dr. Sajish, Dr. Sajish is from Trivandrum, who has been a part of uh, regional anesthesia workshops for several years now, is doing a lot of work in regional anesthesia in Trivandrum, 
And it's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Sajish. Dr. Sajish, to you. Great pleasure in introducing Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis spearheads the uh, regional anesthesia work in Jubilee Mission Hospital in Trishur, has done workshops and conducts yearly annual workshops in Trishur. Thank you very much, sir. I've been part of the last workshop, extremely well organized, advanced course in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. We also have Dr. Sebastian with us from Jubilee Mission Trishur, who is going to share his time with us. Great pleasure in introducing Dr. Jainti Bhatte. Dr. Jainti Bhatte from Mumbai, one of the most popular anesthetists of Thane, who does a lot of work with peripheral nerve stimulators. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Jainti. We have Dr. Venkateshwaran, uh, who is an uh, anesthesiologist working at Ganga Medical Center and Hospital. He's um, part of the uh, spearheads, the trauma management team here. Would we'll just tell a word about him. Um, just wanted to highlight one case which happened last month. Here was a lady run over by a lorry, comes into the hospital at 6.30 on a Saturday evening, gasping, no pressures. Uh, so a line started, little fluid given, just to get the pulse to 60. He does a fast. Initially, there was nothing. Then the pressures went to 70, 75. He saw that the splenic spleen was ruptured. So a fast done by an anesthesiologist himself in the resuscitation room. So sees that there is a bleeding in this from, from the spleen inside. Next fifth minute, this patient is inside the operating room, laparotomy done, splenectomy done. In, you see this patient back home in seven days. The best part is no relatives to sign the papers, no money deposited. That is the policy and principle in which this hospital works. And uh, you might wait for the relatives, but probably if you do so, they have to come with a coffin and not to take the patient back. So we as a medical care providers have to make a huge change in the way we practice anesthesiology in whichever hospital we work. We need to tell the administration what is essential to the patients and we should spearhead this in wherever we work. And Venkateshwaran is doing an excellent work in trauma services and he will be today as be one of the faculty. And um, Surajit Giri, who has done exemplary work in regional anesthesia in Northeast. He has traveled all the way from Jorhat. Surajit, uh, can you please get up? And uh, he has totally changed the concept of regional anesthesia in Northeast. He is young, vibrant, and spreads the message of regional anesthesia. He conducted an excellent live workshop in Jorhat, which we had been part of it a couple of months ago. And that was the first ever live demonstration in Northeast, and the whole thing was organized by Surajit. Surajit does excellent work with peripheral nerve, uh, peripheral nerve stimulators in various parts, various kinds of blocks. Thank you, Surajit, for sharing your time with us and being here. So the time is up. Now we go on to, to the actual works. Before that, would like to ask how many of you practice regional anesthesia nerve blocks in your day-to-day -day practice? Please put your hands up. How many of you have it to start that? Can you please put your hand because I can't make out. Be bold. Be, be, I mean, there is absolutely no problem. Yeah. So just, just to know the spread so that our, uh, the instructors could act accordingly. And how many of you use the landmark technique to give your blocks? How many of you use peripheral nerve stimulators? How many of you use ultrasound? OK, so quite a big number. Two years ago, this number of hands didn't go up for ultrasound. So India is making inroads. It's definitely progressing. That's very nice. Now I have a request. For all those who are sitting in the back, would like all of you to come forward. Please fill up the rows in the front, because now I am going to split this group. We're not going to ask any questions, but please come forward. Please don't leave one seat. Just fill it up. And um, as you're getting, uh, getting seated, would like to tell you that this workshop would go until 4.30. Make sure that you are given enough break for tea and food will all be provided. So I'm sure that uh, several of you might not have your, your morning breakfast. So at 10.30, we will break for a cup of tea and some sandwiches. And <coughs> tomorrow, uh, the, I've not given you any kit today because I wanted your hands to be free in a hands-on workshop. So you could collect all your conference kit, registration kits, everything. Many people might be concerned whether there is nothing. 
but there is going to be something for you, and that's going to be in the morning tomorrow. I have a request to all of you who have registered for the conference. We have to disprove to the world that Indians are not punctual. Let this be the start. If you have to be globally competitive, it starts from the smallest of small things. And I would like and greatly appreciate if you are all registered. Registration starts at 7.30 in the morning tomorrow. And at 8.10, would highly appreciate if you are all here inside this hall to start this session at 8.15. If you have done that for your part, you have put in the first brick in the development of India being a developed nation. And thank you very much for that. And now to all those, um, uh, the delegates would start from, from the first row. Um, I think we'll start from Dr. Vandana Mangal. Uh, Vandana Mangal is the scientific committee chairperson of the forthcoming national conference of ISA Con in Jaipur. She has come all the way to see whether we are performing well. So thank you, madam, for being here. And uh, so now we will start the count. What I would like to do is we have 10 workstations. So I would want, starting from here, 1 to 10. And please remember what you counted. All the ones will form one group. All the two will be the second group. Three, it goes likewise. OK? So we'll start with one from Dr. Vandana Mangal. One, yeah. Dr. Fawazi, you're number two. He's from Egypt. He has traveled all the way from Egypt to be a part of this. Your number is two. Yeah. You can count it, sir. So you are a part of the work. You're a delegate. Yeah, you have to count, sir. Three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Surinder, eight. Yeah. No, no. Nine. Ten was there? Yeah, ten. Nine. Ten. Yeah, louder, please. Yeah. So that's perfect. Can I ask all the number ones to get up, please? Venkateshwaran, can you take them to your workstation? Yeah, it's going to be starting with an anatomy cadaver. So please join, and you need to climb the stage and go to the back, because we can't get the cadaver into the auditorium. Number two, led by Dr. Jainti Bhatte, can you please get up? All those number two will go with Dr. Jainti Bhatte to the, to the side. You're going up, Dr. Jainti, and uh, Sendhil, can you just guide them? Yeah. All the three will be led by Surajit Giri. Surajit, can you get up? So your station is there in the back. So all those threes will join Dr. Surajit. Four is Dr. Silish. Dr. Silish, can you please get up? You're also in the back. So all the fours will join with Dr. Silish. Five is with Dr. Satish Gulkarni. So he's going to come to the front here. Dr. Satish, sir.